Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to uh, be able to introduce today's speaker, who is Gerhard Weikum from the uh, Max Planck Institute in Germany. Uh, Gerhard is, uh, has a long and distinguished career in, uh, in the database area and uh, has been a, a visitor uh, with us uh, on a number of occasions before, uh, some of which turned out really well. And um, so we're hoping that this visit will also turn out well. Um, <laughs> Gerhard is, is, in fact, a director of the Max Planck Institute. He's an ACM fellow, uh, and he is the uh, was chair or president of the, of the uh, BLDB Endowment? President. President of the BLDB Endowment. So he has, uh, he's been a leader in the field now for quite a number of years, and uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be able to introduce him. And he'll be talking about harvesting, searching, and ranking knowledge on the web. Gerhard. Thank you, Dave, for the flattering intro. Even though it's flattering, uh, I still appreciate it. Uh, so the vision that drives this work is uh, the, the goal to turn the web, uh, whatever new web we will have in the near future, into the world's most comprehensive knowledge base, into a semantic database that does not only know about web pages and text in web pages, but about entities and relations between entities. And the approach that we are pursuing with the people uh, that I'm collaborating with is uh, a three-step procedure. So first is get the knowledge, um, lift the web pages into more explicit uh, notions of facts, organize this. Um, and there's different ways of doing this. So I will, in this talk, I will mostly talk about leveraging handcrafted high quality knowledge, ideally in the form of ontologies, but maybe also looking at encyclopedia. But there's other ways, like we can use text mining, natural language processing, statistic learning to go after the, the, the implicit facts that are embedded in natural language text. We're doing also some of this too, but it will not be in this, uh, presented in this talk. Or we can try to harness the, uh, the, the, the folk wisdom, the wisdom of the crowds that's implicit in social tagging platforms and other things along these lines. Once we have the knowledge, next step is how do we query it? And, and of course, we want to raise the bar here as well. So we, just, we don't not only want to run like simple keyword queries, but go after sophisticated things. And you will see examples. And it involves searching, but also ranking results. Often you end up with a lot of results. And so ranking is, um, is absolutely crucial. And finally, all that should be done efficiently and, and uh, scalable. So why can't we do this with Google today? Suppose we run Google just limited to the Wikipedia domain. That's the closest approximation to my goals. Uh, but that does not work well. And here's just a bunch of examples where this uh, Google-centric approach would fail. So in um, natural sciences, here's one example from life sciences, you're often interested in specific entities and then relationships between these entities. That theme also shows up in humanities. Uh, so I'm working a little bit with uh, people from humanities. So here the not so obvious connection between Thomas Mann and Goethe is that Thomas Mann wrote a novel early 20th century, Lotte in Weimar, which features Goethe, who was dead more than 100 years by then, but features Goethe as a character in the novel. So that would be cool to figure that one out. Then we have quiz question-like things, where, which are easy to answer for a human, because a human can get the bits and pieces from the web with some effort, and they might even be structured. So birth dates, um, death dates, and so on, they, they're pretty structured. But the human still needs to find a lot, quite a few of these bits and pieces and connect them in the right way. So these joints, if, if things were in a database, it would be trivial. But these joints, doing them directly over the web is a pain. The answer, by the way, is unfortunately Max Planck, who died in 1947 after he had lost the last of his four children. And then some of them are actually simple queries, but they involve of ranking over lots of re uh, results. And just to drive my point home, I tried this one, which politicians are also scientists. You can vary the way you express this to Google. You can write it as a natural language question because Google has some abilities to, to, to deal with these, and the results don't get better than this, right? So this is uh, mostly about scientists and politicians debating global warming, etc. 
Um, and what's wrong here, so I, this is one of my favorite quotations by Frank Zappa. Um, the first line is the key point here, information is not knowledge. This is really raw information. These are raw assets, but it's not knowledge. It's not lifted to the higher level, and you, you can read here the further levels above the level of knowledge, right? And uh, the first line is, is very good. The rest, I don't know, maybe he smoked too much grass at that time. Uh, <laughs> So, and this is an, a screenshot from one of the prototype engines that we've built, uh, called Naga. Uh, of course, we're not good at, at gu doing GUIs, uh, <laughs> and, and I will explain what's going on here. This is, uh, and, uh, but we do ranking, and the ranking is pretty good, because there's, uh, the data comes from Wikipedia, and there are thousands of people that qualify, and what we get at the very top is Benjamin Franklin, who invented the lightning rod, and also parts of the U.S. Constitution, Paul Wolfowitz is well known, Angela Merkel is the German Chancellor, and she has a degree in physics and wrote a dissertation about uh, physical chemistry. So this is about the best you can get here in terms of ranking. I don't have any real slides or elaborated uh, part of the talk on related work. This could be open-ended. I could talk half an hour or longer only about related work. Essentially, what's going on is that I see three major areas which are making great advances in the, in, in the last few years. Uh, and we position ourselves essentially in the intersection of these. So, uh, of course, web search does look at entities. Uh, but in a limited way, driven by business uh, opportunities like prod if, if it's about products, if it's about location, then yes, of course, they do uh, some form of uh, dealing with named entities. Uh, to my knowledge, they don't go far in terms of relations among entities. Uh, information extraction has, has gone a long way uh, based on text mining and other techniques. And for about a decade, we've seen that ranking over structured or semi-structured data also makes a lot of sense. Now this is the outline. It's essentially three systems and three papers. So the first is about the, the Yago system and the knowledge base that we've built this way. Uh, and this corresponds to a paper we had in last year's dub dub dub. Then it's the search engine and the ranking over this data, Coint Naga, which appeared in ICDE this year. And the last one then, right now not yet integrated, but we're in the process of putting this underneath as the engine underneath the, uh, the other stuff. Uh, this is a very fast uh, RDF engine, Coint RDF Triple Express, which is going to appear in this year's VLDB. And, and oh, by the way, you need to drive me, or you, you can drive me in terms of where I put emphasis on and which parts I may have to skip. It's maybe a, a bit too much material. So if, when you have questions or when you think, uh, rush on and, and let me know, right? Um, so now the first part is about building knowledge bases. How do we go about this? So we could do uh, text mining based information extraction, uh, for example, from this old Wikipedia page about Max Planck, and uh, that would essentially move the text into a structured, seemingly structured database uh, um, in terms of records. So we can find the, the birth dates, birthplaces of scientists, uh, scientific results, uh, more details about these, maybe even combining some of what we see here with other sources. Not everything that you see on the right is actually written here, right? Uh, collaboration and so forth. And the techniques for doing this is a combination of, of methodologies. So natural language processing plays a role um, pattern matching, some of the low-hanging fruit is just regular expression matching, so birth dates is actually easy, email addresses would be even easier. Um, uh, statistical learning might play a role, so we need training material, just a second, uh, in, 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 in order to determine whether something should move from here to the structured site or not. We can also reject hypotheses. And some of that is boosted by simple assets like uh, lists of place names, for example. Kiel is a place name, so it would be in a dictionary of German cities. Jonathan, yeah? I'm just wondering, you know, the degree to which the discovery of the, the fields that you want to relate, so for instance, scientific result, you know, to what degree is that automatic? Uh, so somebody said, well, assigning persons to scientific results is important, so let's look at that. Okay, maybe the, the next pop-up kind of addresses this. So there's now a few remarks. Uh, 
So one is these, these, this looks like a database, but it's kind of a different database. So there's uncertainty. So certainly, usually we don't have confidence one in these extractions. So there might be a few exceptions because birth dates are so simple, we, we, we might have uh, confidence close to one, but certainly not in these things like inventions and so on, right? And we need to, in the long run, we need to quantify these uh, confidence measures and later on reason, take them into consideration when we reason over this, this uh, knowledge base. So there's, there's uncertainty that we need to carry on, right? Does this roughly address your, your concern, right? And, 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 and also different techniques give you different confidence, right? So on the, the kinds of relationships, there are some easy ones and some tough ones, right? This is certainly not among the easy ones. So second remark is some of the techniques are very expensive. So we actually built a tool a few years ago, which employs a dependency parser and then feeds uh, feature representations into a statistical learner. But the dependency parser, which is a deep natural language parsing technique, takes about a minute on a long Wikipedia article. Maybe not on this one because it's shorter. So it does not scale up. Second thing is, again, coming back to the, to the uh, question or remark here, uh, the confidence is sometimes much less than one, right? So you can sometimes really uh, fish uh, in the dark and, and get hairy fact candidates. Uh, and then you end up with some uh, ugly problem of um, uh, configuring all kinds of thresholds and parameters of your extraction uh, machinery. Uh, and that's a black art, right? So we, although we have worked on, along these lines and we're still pursuing it, we uh, at some point actually turned, turned step back and, 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 and wanted to at least produce a core of high accuracy knowledge uh, that would not suffer from these problems, also with uh, more better scalability properties. So we looked at the available high quality handcrafted knowledge sources uh, as opposed to arbitrary natural language texts. And we wanted sources that are already closer to a knowledge base. So ideally maybe uh, already in, in a logic based representation like ontologies, but there are no super big ontologies available. So the closest that we've been working, uh, that we, um, we um, closest to approximation to an ontology would be things like WordNet, for example which is kind of something weaker but can be turned into a lightweight ontology. And this one here would, uh, this is a screenshot, would tell you here there's, there's a concept of scientists and there are special cases, hyponyms or subclasses of scientists. So that might help um, getting the knowledge to answering the politician and scientist query. Uh, interestingly, WordNet also sometimes has instances um, but here it has Roger Bacon, an alchemist from the Middle uh, Ages, uh, but doesn't seem to have Aristotle and many others are just, I mean, this is just total arbitrary set of samples and it's very small. And that tells you something about the strengths and weaknesses of these approaches. It was very strong in the taxonomic uh, relations. So it has lots of um, concepts, abstract concepts, and essentially is our relations among them and parts of relations and things of that kind, but it lacks knowledge about individual entities. So th there should be thousands of physicists or scientists in this, in this um, ontology, but they are not. The source for this, uh, this other side of knowledge, the individual entities, is Wikipedia. Now it looks superficially that we're back to text mining because of these entries, but we're not. So when you look close uh, enough and carefully enough, you see this is actually structured data, this so-called info box, and these info boxes appear pretty frequently. And so this is the source code of the info box. It actually follows a template for scientists. And there are quite a few of these templates. There's one for pop bands. There's one for, for companies. So you can, you see the CEO of a company. You see the drummer of a, of a pop band and so on. And here, for example, you see the doctoral advisor, right? And, and, and other interesting facts. So this can be harvested fairly easily. There's more things. Uh, many Wikipedia articles are placed manually, but with the community-based quality control into a rich category system. So the Max Planck page, for example, is here in these categories. So even if we didn't get the birth and death year from the info boxes, um, which might be the case for some lesser known scientists, then these categories tell us at least the year. Uh, they also give us instance of relations, so we can figure out that Max Planck was a physicist 
or a, a German physicist, but that's again a specialization. And sometimes we need to be careful, Max Planck is not a physics, right? So he's a physicist, that's a, an important uh, uh, detail uh, and makes a difference. So we did this systematically. We went systematically after the info boxes and the Wikipedia category system and built a, a fairly big knowledge base that we've coined Yago for yet another great ontology. Um, and the way we represent the extracted facts is in the form of knowledge of triples, two entities connected by a binary relation, right? So you can represent this in logic if you wish uh, or in RDF. RDF is kind of a natural representation here, actually. Uh, we not only harvested Wikipedia in a systematic manner, but we connected the extracted facts to the existing WordNet taxonomic backbone. And this is maybe the not so easy uh, thing. So we, we tried to, to place every entity that we extract from Wikipedia into the right uh, classes in the taxonomic space of WordNet. And when we invent new classes in the from Wikipedia, like category names, like German physicist, as a, in this combination is not in WordNet, why would it, right? So we need to map it uh, into the uh, taxonomic space and make sure it becomes a subclass of physicist. And then WordNet would already know that physicist is a subclass of scientist and so on. So this gives you more of a, a more complete but still a very tiny uh, picture of uh, what we did here. It's publicly available. It's pretty, pretty big has like two million, close to two million entities and more than 50 million facts. Facts are always instances of binary relations. And it's much bigger than Psyche, for example, and, and Sumo and a bunch of other things that are available uh, in the public. Uh, we are smaller than this other uh, concurrent endeavor to harvest to Wikipedia called DBpedia. But part of the explanation is that we actually gave Iago to them. Uh, so it's incorporated, right? And they have a lot more facts because they don't have that goal of staying close, mostly consistent, and staying at a very high level of accuracy. But they just form unions of things. So if they get redundancy, they just add, 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 and then they uh, create links. But it's pretty noisy, pretty redundant, and so they cannot properly reason about consistency. Um, we're also in the process of giving this to the Freebase guys, which is a startup company in the Bay Area, where the approach is a bit different. They would say, um, why we should not just harvest what's existing already, but we should get a big community to actually enter facts in the form of database records. So they should already be entered in structured form. Uh, but here again, the issue is, how do you get a, a coherent whole as opposed to just a huge collection of uh, uh, detached uh, bits and pieces, right? So I think by using Yago as a backbone, they, are, they should be in a much better position. We manually uh, evaluated accuracy by um, uh, extensive sampling. And the accuracy is, is, this is a conservative figure because we used like Wilson, um, um, confidence intervals and, and everything. Uh, and the errors that we, we actually observed are often errors that already come with Wikipedia. So this is, I'm not saying this is deep science. Not a, it's not very scientific at all. The, the things we did earlier and that did not work so well were a lot deeper <laughs> and required. <laughs> but but this, so this is picking low-hanging fruit by the right engineering. Um, the extractor software is also made uh, open source now, and it runs pretty fast. So it's a few hours and it processes all of Wikipedia and combines it with WordNet. So you can repeat it on a daily basis if you wish to. So, but here's just, the, still the engineering has its problems. So here's a few examples where you need the right engineering. So it's non-trivial. Uh, one is this uh, uh, finding the, the, instance, the instances of the instance of relation. So when we see, this mostly comes from seeing an entity appearing in certain categories in the Wikipedia system. And uh, as I said earlier, there are the, the good um, category names like Nobel laureates and the bad ones like American music of the 20th century. Many singers are in their categories, but a singer is not a piece of music. Uh, so it turns out a simple heuristic works pretty well. We run a noun group parser over these uh, um, noun phrases. And if the so-called head word is uh, plural, then it's indeed a, a class. If it's singular, we should not apply it. So phys physics and music is singular. And there are some meta categories like disputed articles where you just need to hand code, hardwire that you should not fall into this trap. How, how do you know that physics is, is singular? 
Oh, these noun group parsers have that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> something similar shows up here. So when you want, when sometimes we actually learn about new classes, like these composite or specialized classes, uh, like Nobel laureates in physics, right? So we and we do capture this, right? So we want to keep that, uh, but we need to connect it to the right superclass in WordNet. And he here too, these techniques help a lot. So for example, here we know that uh, people is the plural of person, right? So parsers uh, know this. Natural language tools are pretty good these days. And, and by the way, we use other people's tools on, for that, right? So there's more things in the entity name space. Of course, we cannot produce any miracles. We don't do entity name disambiguation here, but we, we actually harvest the ambiguity. If, if there's five ways of referring to the same entity, we learn it from, from this input. Uh, so for example, this one here points to via the... Uh, Wikipedia redirection system to one thing, and this one points to the same thing. They don't cross-reference each other directly, but by transitivity, we know they de denote the same entity, namely, little test for the audience. Andromeda what? Andromeda wow, very good. Wow, I forgot to bring you some chocolate, so I, you, you, usually I give out little little uh, <laughs> rewards to the audience if they uh, work well. And uh, in general, we have a, a methodology here. It's a, it's a, it's a collection of heuristics rule and, and rules, right? But we have a, an overriding methodology that we coin uh, reductive type checking. So we, we're willing to get lots of fact candidates, but then we run them through some uh, scrutinizing procedures. So we want to make sure that the whole knowledge base stays consistent. So for example, the taxonomic part should not never become cyclic. Uh, and, uh, and we do what we call type checks in this knowledge base sense. So when we see, for example, uh, for whatever reason, we might we also do text mining, right? So some text mining um, tool would give us a conjecture that Max Planck is married to, to quantum physics because the sentence said Max Planck was married to his work, right? So, but now the married to relation is a relation between two people ideally of opposite gender. So we have a type violation and we reject that fact candidate. So mo we mostly build on a first order fact. Jonathan, yeah? You might have uh, uh, a paper that he co-authored with somebody who's also married to their work and therefore conclude that they were in fact <laughs> Wow. <laughs> So thanks for this is a new project for a new student. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing is perfect here. I mean, you're you're right. <laughs> um, so we, we mostly build on just vanilla first order logic. So so these are just instances of binary relations, and that goes a long way. But once in a while, you come across a need for higher order uh, representations. So here we see Berlin is the capital of Germany, but we might also find that Bonn is the capital of Germany, and, the, and no country should have two capitals. We, we can also add constraints, right? So we could have logical constraints in the knowledge base. And the explanation is that these refer to different time epochs. Uh, so how do we represent this? This looks like higher order, because the valid n is now a binary relation between first order facts and some other constants. Uh, but there's a standard trick in this uh, community that's been around for decades, and, and RDF uses this too, so it's called reification. We just uh, give these uh, facts here, IDs, and then we can use the IDs as arguments to what used to be higher order facts. Just to make sure you don't think only Germany has problems with this, so the world in the US, has, at least in California, is also not so simple. But of course it comes from a, an Austrian, you, you can blame it on Europe. <laughs> So if I have time, I, here, here's a, a few words now where, where we stand and what, we, what we're doing now. So this goes back to actually uh, deeper scientific things. So we, oh, we believe Iago knows all the interesting entities. It, uh, it's not really true, but we could make it true. So if you are a politician of some village, you better be, uh, you're the mayor of some village, you better be in Wikipedia. And typically you are. If you are the drummer of some gar garage band and, and you want to make a career, uh, you are in Wikipedia. So exceptions are computer scientists. Uh, Wikipedia is not strong in, in this regard, but we could systematically harvest DBLP or DB, uh, what's it called, DB Life and, 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 and sources. I mean, there are sources for this. Then there's, for example, biochemical entities. 
Um, of course, Wikipedia knows a lot of enzymes, proteins, drugs, diseases, but this is a big zoo of, of, of terminology. But there are things like UMLS, so the life scientists, they also uh, do their job, do their homework and organize their terminological and taxonomic things. So this could be uh, leveraged and imported. So I think we're pretty much done in terms of entities. What we're missing is the coverage in terms of relations, both relation types, there are so many interesting relation types that we don't know about, and then also the instances for the relation. So we, we, we do go back to uh, the text mining now, and our tool that we built a few years ago um, works as follows. It, uh, it runs natural language sentences through a dependency parser and builds these graph representations with cryptic tagging going on, but an expert can, can, can read this. And this is the, still a syntactic um, representation, but it comes closest from a linguistic viewpoint to a semantic interpretation, if, you're, if you stay within context-free grammars here. Um, and, and we can use this, for example, the shortest uh, dependency path between the two arguments of interest as, as a feature representation for statistical learning. And if we were willing to, to have some training, we could mark this as a positive sample for a learner and this as a negative sample. And then the learner could digest sentences like this, right? So, and then would say, yes, indeed, Paris is located on the Seine, hopefully, right? Uh, but this is expensive, as I mentioned earlier. So, and this is why we actually did not pursue it as aggressively as we could have done two years ago. Um, but I think we are now in a much better position to do, to reconsider this. Because Iago as a backbone gives us uh, a, a head start now. So uh, we can filter out many uninteresting sentences that we come across because they don't contain two entities that might possibly be related to each other. And, that, and we get a lot of this information from Iago already. Uh, we can quickly identify the relation arguments and we can do type checks. Um, so if we're after the runs through relation, it better, we better look at sentences where one argument, one entity is of type river and the other is of type location at least, right? And we could do more fancy things like uh, check that the river and the city are at least in the same continent. Otherwise, why, why would they be nearby? So these are things we're looking at now, is ongoing work, no hard results yet. We're particularly focusing on time aspects. So because we have lots of interesting facts, some of this is low hanging fruit, like the CEOs <coughs> of companies and things of that kind, but it's time evolving. So it's interesting to check out at what time points uh, did which facts hold. Okay. So, oh, something got messed up here in the order. We'll see. Okay, so second part is the search. Um, now that we have this knowledge base, uh, we also thought about how do we search it? And then whenever queries produce too many results, how do we uh, do the ranking? Yes, please? I have one question about the information extraction part. So, it seems easy or at least possible to extract various facts from Wikipedia or other sources, but how do you know what kind of relations to extract? Like runs through relation, parallel relation, bond in relation, are this hand coded or are these also obtained automatically from some sources? So some of the, very good question, some of the relation names come just from the info boxes, right? So it says uh, headquarter or something or is or CEO colon, right? So, and, and we can infer then that this is a relation between a person and a company and we name it after what we see in the info boxes. Uh, in other ways, we, we have to handcraft like a catalog of interesting relation names. Um, and, and this is a bit unsatisfactory on the other hand, um, I give this some thought and I asked some pretty smart people. Um, so what we're asking, it's a tall order. What we're asking for is the universal catalog of entity relationship types. So like we all know this from, from school, right? So the world has more than just departments and employees, right? We're not talking instances, only the types and, and shipment and, and order and so on. So we, we want to do this universally. What, what, what are interesting relationship types in the world? So what's the best um, data dictionary or catalog of relationship types? 
And, and none of the people I've talked to, and some of them have been working on this conceptual modeling for decades, had a good answer. So I had good hopes that, for example, something like Google Base would give me clues. Uh, it's not about relations, but it's about attribute names. And I talked to Alon Halevi, for example, and he told me, forget it. Uh, Google Base is all about used cars, right? So you and, and, and I would love to see, for example, interesting relations between uh, people, like uh, once in a while I watch uh, strange movies with complicated plots, so I, after a while I'm totally lost and I don't know who's actually the nephew of whom and, and who falls in love with whom. Well, this is the easy part, actually. <laughs> who's jealous and so on, right? So these are all interesting relations and only between people. I, I mean, so you're t very well and good question, but it's a tall order. Okay, other questions? So then the, the search, because we like the graph-based visualization of the data, we also came up with a graph-based language. But you can rehash this into some other representation. And some of these queries are actually pretty straightforward from a database viewpoint. So this is a vanilla conjunctive query, uh, uh, e easy, easy thing in, in SQL or, or any other of the uh, established languages. Um, in graph form, we, 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 all we do is we replace some of the graph nodes by variables. And then the semantics is you find bindings to these variables from the data such that after you replace the variable with the bind uh, binding, um, this becomes a, a subgraph or this is seen as a subgraph in the data. So. Um, we have some additions which are now no longer that straightforward. So here the Thomas Mann-Goethe relationship question would actually be addressed by a big, uh, or formulated by a big wild card. And we call this relatedness or connectedness query. So here's a bunch of entities. Tell me how, how are they related? Do they have commonalities? Did they interact in some way? And the answer is, would mostly be the, the labels of the, in this case, even path that connect the entities. And that's a special case, just a second, a special case of having regular expressions in the language. And here we don't have a good characterization, uh, not yet. How, what does this actually entail in terms of expressiveness, complexity, and so on? But nevertheless, we, we, we wanted to have this. So this is about like the one way of reasoning about the strong German universities. And now you see it has like little disjunctions here. It has Kleene star because the located in hierarchy can be very, can have variable depth and so forth. Jonathan. Connected this query, uh, we have something like Goethe and Thomas Mann, and Goethe and Thomas Mann like that. Um, you know, if there's multiple paths, how do you sort of pick which one? I'll come to that. I'll come to that. So the ranking is, an, is a big issue here, right? Right now, this is just query, and we get result sets, or yeah, and then the ranking is, is actually very important. And we can also have queries over these reified facts, right? And they can. Be, there's also a linear syntax for this. So now we come to the ranking, and here I, mess, I messed up my slides, so I need to sh go back and then forward again. I, I messed, messed up order of slides for whatever reason. So now, now ask a query like, Fisher is a scientist, what else is Fisher known for, right? And maybe there are many Fishers, there are indeed, right? Um, and we, we run this without ranking, so we get exact results, but the order in which we get the results back, and there's thousands of them, is, is arbitrary. And this is the top result, Ronald Fisher, the alumnus of, of this college in Cambridge. And when you go a little bit further in the ranking, so Ronald Fisher is a good result. Everybody knows why? Who, is, who was Ronald Fisher? So he, in, he invented maximum likelihood estimation. He's probably the... the most important statistician of the last century. And then there's two unknown fishers. Why would they be on rank two and three? They happen to be, right? Then there's Ronald Fisher, the theorist, Ronald Fisher, the colleague, very important property, Ronald Fisher, the organism, and then the Ronald Fisher, the entity, and so on, right? And so this is wrong. I mean, this is not what we want. This is the uh, flawed ranking. But unless you have ranking, you re ranking is, is greatly underappreciated. I think it really must be a first-class citizen here. It cannot be an afterthought. 
And indeed, we have developed a statistical language model for this graph-based representation, which computes better rankings. Namely, it gives us Ronald Fisher, the mathematician, the statistician, the president of the Royal Statistics Society, the encoded IDs, so you have to follow the, the relationships in order to find that out. Then Ronald Fisher sh started his career with doing crops experiments, and then for doing, giving significance to them, he had to invent statistics and then change the field and so on. So it's pretty good. So what are the criteria? And here one of them uh, is, is the answer to your question, Jonathan. So there's three big dimensions for, the, the, for uh, ranking criteria. The first one is confidence, because even though we, we've been driven a lot by this Yago extractor, which is high accuracy, but we should have other extractors as well. And then the, uh, the accuracy or confidence in, into the extracted facts varies widely. And there are two sub-dimensions to this. There's the certainty of the extractor. I mean, if you use a risky learning-based technique with very little training data, your confidence cannot be as high as, for example, extracting email addresses by regular expression matching. And the other dimension is the authenticity and the authority of sources. Actually, it's two sub-dimensions, right? These are different things. And you see this illustrated just by examples. So a straightforward sentence, Max Planck was born in Kiel from a high authority source, which never lies, should be taken for almost granted. Uh, whereas if you see this weird sentence, they believe Elvis hides on Mars in this strange blog, uh, be careful about this. Oh, uh, there's, this is big picture here, this, this is, so we have pragmatic implementations of this. Now we can break this down into do this or that. So one of the easy things is you go by page rank, right? So authority is, is easier than authenticity. Authenticity is about saying the truth, right? <laughs> as, as opposed to, I mean, you can be a high authority source about jokes, right? <laughs> okay, so second dimension. And I will elaborate a little bit on that one, right? Because I think it's the most interesting. For we have we have implemented something on each of those, but um, there needs to be more work, right, to make this systematic. So informativeness is about telling something interesting. Don't tell me Fisher is an entity. Uh, and uh, and ideally, this would be a subjective uh, criterion. And in fact, it, the word is a concept in linguistics and cognitive sciences. It, there it would mean, tell me something that I didn't know before. But then you need to personalize it. You need to know something about the user. And for the time being, we don't have this. So for the time being, we would say, tell me something that most people find interesting. So it's really driven by frequency statistics, different kinds. But we could, we're working on personalizing it, and then it could mean, tell me something that I didn't know before. And it's illustrated again by examples. Suppose we're asking, what's Einstein known for? So most people would prefer an answer like, Einstein was a scientist rather than Einstein was a vegetarian. Uh, of course, if you are yourself an accomplished physicist, maybe you do prefer the second one. But without knowing anything about the user, we can't do this. Now, you cannot just pre-compute relevance or informativeness of facts because this is context dependent. This depends on the query. You take a slightly different query, give me important vegetarians. And then this one, which should rank low here, should rank high here. Right? So th th there's no easy solution to this. And I will explain in the next slide how we do it. The third dimension is what Jonathan asked before. So results should be compact in some form. If it's just a path between entities, we prefer short path over long ones. Maybe the path labels also and the frequencies of how, how dominant are they used in the overall knowledge base might play a role and things of that kind. Um, and sometimes we want to connect more than just two entities, and then we actually look at compact graphs. This leads to Steiner tree computations, unfortunately. So we're also biting here a, 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 into a, a computationally expensive uh, bullet. Uh, but we're doing work along these lines. Again, illustration by example. So we ask about how is Einstein related to Bohr? This is a good answer inferring that Tom Cruise is also a vegetarian and was born in the year in which Niels Bohr died is kind of weird, right? So it should rank lower, right? But you need ranking to get this, this out, right? So how do we do the informativeness part of the ranking? We uh, follow best practice in information retrieval, which is based on 
statistical language models. Now these are generative uh, probabilistic models. So the, the, the rationale is that you have a bunch of documents and each document is viewed as a probability distribution over observable features, for example words or normalized terms. And, uh, and often you might postulate a parametric form for this. So for example, it's a multinomial distribution. And then the document itself can be used to estimate parameters. But maybe you want a background corpus for smoothing the parameter estimation. Now the query is now treated as something that would be generated by a document. This is, on first glance, it's kind of an, an, an odd rational, but this is how, how it works. So you pretend the query is a sample from the probability distribution of this document, or this document, or that document, or that document. And uh, you prefer in the ranking those documents for which the likelihood of actually observing that query is highest. So this is the, the model. And then, of course, you can use Bayesian arguments to reverse everything, and then it looks a bit different. So we did this, uh, we applied this too, but uh, we're, we're not just having text documents. Now some of these language models have been carried over to attributes and records, but not to relationships to my knowledge. So this is something new we did. Um, and and uh, often you run into uh, both uh, sparseness issues for parameter estimation and also computational tractability. So we're just like many other people, we factorize our probabilistic models into independent components. And here the unit of factorization is one edge essentially. So the smallest meaningful subgraph is one edge and its label and its two endpoints, the entities that uh, together constitute the fact. Um, and, and, and now, so these would be the things that generate queries, and, and this is a query now with a parameter. So in some sense, we're after asking, given this born in Goethe Frankfurt fact, what's the probability of generating this query? Or in other words, you can give it some intuitive meaning. If a user asks this query and were presented this fact, would the user be satisfied? I happen to be born also in Frankfurt, right? So there's a good test case. Um, and, and, but I would not claim that I should rank higher than Goethe, right? So I, I'm the other candidate for generating this query. And then there's some bells and whistles here, which we're going to skip. And I'm going to explain, but by example, how we then estimate these query likelihoods. In the end, it boils down to simple correlation statistics. Uh, so you might say, ah, oh, well, very easy and very simple, but the framework is much more powerful because we could now generalize it and take more things into consideration and stay in the same formal apparatus, apparatus which is nice. So uh, let's do this by example. So here, these two facts could generate this query. So what we do, we estimate the probability that the the, the, the answer part, which binds to the variable $x, namely myself or Goethe, appears in some corpus given that the other, the input constants appear. So it's about what's the probability of seeing Goethe given that you see born in and Frankfurt? Or what's the probability of seeing me given that you see born in and Frankfurt? So and then for different query types, depending on how many variables we have, we can have two variables. Uh, in a meaningful way, things change a little bit. Now, the actual estimates for these conditional probabilities can come, and according to the book, they should come from your main corpus, but that might be easily misleading. So you do this on the knowledge graph itself, and if you happen to have way more physicists than vegetarians, because uh, of the way the conditional probabilities are, are defined, uh, that would actually give higher rank to the vegetarian part, right? Because the, this, uh, the uh, is a vegetarian appears in the uh, denominator here. And so what we actually, we tried this, it doesn't work well because no knowledge base is perfectly balanced and the knowledge, and it doesn't have redundancy and redundancy helps a lot in statistics. So we actually go for the web on, in this case or some sample of, of web data that we pre-compute and do the uh, estimations there. You saw this, so we did um, systematic uh, user studies with uh, question answering queries and some queries uh, by ourselves. We compared to a bunch of 
kind of competitors. Uh, often you get quickly into an apples versus oranges comparison here, but at least you're not comparing apples against T-bone steaks, right? So, uh, and and so the results have to be interpreted very carefully, uh, and I will, will not elaborate on this. So the main point is that some techniques actually Google does very well on many of the question answering things. Yahoo Answers, which matches new questions against human uh, manually answered existing questions from a big catalog is lousy. This is a question answering system done by MIT, which also utilizes Wikipedia. This is why it's interesting to compare with. This is uh, keyword graph search. We only we actually use our engine, but take their this their uh, scoring model for the ranking, and this is us. So we we are doing pretty well. Questions so far? Uh, interpret the numbers on the previous slide. Uh. Um, so, in terms of the task that you had the students do, is that you gave them like a broad question? You, you, you told them somehow research the answer to the following question and you know use whatever. No, 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 no. Thing. We. Well, indirectly, yes. So we, we each, each, this is why I said uh, it's apples versus oranges. So because they have different input uh, ways of taking the input, they also have different corpora, right? So we tried various ways of formulating the, the, the queries for each of them. We did, right? And uh, I mean, we is the pool of people that we're, we're working together. So we tried to be, to be as good as possible for each of them. Right. With our system, there was typically one way, one canonical way of formulating the query, but here you have tons of ways. You're right. Yeah. But we tried. We gave them a fair, fair uh, chance. We tried lots of ways, and this is the outcome. So I uh, take this as a big grain of salt. Don't overrate it. Five minutes? Fifteen. Oh, okay. Thank you. So that's plenty of time. So the last part is now about efficiency. Um, and it's not yet integrated, right? So, so Yago can be downloaded, both uh, data and the knowledge base and the extractors. Naga is kind of prototypical. It, we have a web demo, but it's not very stable, and sometimes it's awfully slow, sometimes it's fast. Most of the queries on the previous slide can be answered in a few seconds, right? Even with Naga and the ranking. Um, but sometimes you run into big problems. So we also gave some thought to efficiency here. And because we're using uh, a, a, a knowledge representation model that is close to RDF, so we got into RDF. And also because last year's best paper in VLDB uh, kind of won, won the best paper award with this engineering exercise on RDF. So I felt like we could do better. And indeed, together with one of the people in my group, Thomas Neumann, we did something better. So why RDF and why can't you just reuse your good old SQL engine for this? So why RDF is pretty clear. I mean, here's another of these knowledge graph excerpts, but uh, the edges pretty much correspond to RDF triples. In RDF terminology, these would be called subject property object triples. And there's lots of ID encoding going on. And, and strictly speaking, some of these must be URLs or URIs and so on. So I'm using simplified syntax here. Now, why can't you just reuse some engine? Why does, is it at least a good, ex a healthy exercise to rethink architectures? Well, RDF lends itself pretty nicely to this new paradigm known as pay-as-you-go data spaces. So you just enter data. And, and in fact, probably this is why uh, biolo biologists like it more than, for example, XML. Or, or why don't they put everything in a, into a relational database uh, first? Uh, so don't, don't need to worry about schemas. Maybe some schema evolve, but then you can quickly change the data or group it or whatever. Maybe it never evolves. That's also fine, right? So it's schema last, if ever, right? And this is a nice paradigm that we like. Uh, the triples form. A, an entity relationship graph, but because of triples, they are, this is very fine-grained. So there's no notion of distinguishing attributes of an entity from its relationships. They all are properties. So this blows up the whole thing, and syntactically, you don't have an easy way of grouping things into more manageable units. Uh, as a result, the queries are big joins. Um, often you have lots of star joins, but also long uh, chains of joins, along relationships, and therefore the physical design is very critical. 
But if we are in this new world of data spaces or supporting an, an, a scientist or supporting kids and uh, high school kids, uh, like browsing and, and discovering things in a knowledge base, there's no workload predictability. You cannot just say last year's month was like this, next year's month will be like that. Uh, so it's totally ad hoc, right? So the language that people advocate, I don't like it, but it's still this is up as, an, as a uh, World Wide Web uh, standard, is coined Sparkle. It's pretty much select, project, join uh, combinations uh, encoded in these so-called triple patterns. So everything with a question mark is a variable uh, that can be in the place of a subject, a property, or an object. Then you see the relations like is a born in and so on, and you see some constants. And the dot in between these things, these triple patterns, is actually a conjunction, so this mean entails a join in relational jargon. There are some complications. Uh, in particular, the relations can also be uh, a, a, a variable, uh, which is, makes it interesting. It means you don't care so much about the schema. Um, so, for example, here we would say some person is related to some town and the town to some country, but we don't exactly say which by which relations whether the person is born in that city, died in the city, lived in the city, knows someone who lives in the city, if that were one relation, or this is the capital of some city that once belonged to this country, and so on. So if you unfolded this into a sequel, it would be a huge union, and then for each of the cases, you get long, big joints, right? So this is a pain. This is what prompted the Abadi paper. To some extent, I'm repeating the arguments from last year's paper. And then there's some typing, of course, which so far we, we think we know how to address this, but we haven't done it in the engine so far. Now, coming back to physical design, there's different uh, prevalent approaches. Uh, this RDF thing is, has been around for a decade, and everybody just smiled at it. Uh, and, and now, only recently, people take it more serious. So the, the oldest approach is probably you put everything into this uh, big table with only triples. And then you need to operate over this, which and all the queries entail lots of self-joints with this big table. So our body said this uh, really sucks. So so this, you cannot do this, uh, but it's our approach. So we, you will see in a short while why it works. Then Abadi actually advocated this uh, thing here. You group the triples by the, the same properties, and you do this to the extreme form. So you end up with um, um, uh, the, the maximum form of vertical partitioning. Uh, and then, because the, the property is encoded in the table name, you have, you have, a, you have almost a column store. So uh, no big surprise, they actually use a column store for storing this and, and, and indexing, etc., and doing the query processing. There are things in between which are kind of more closer to the conceptual, to a conceptual entity relationship model, but they are difficult to handle. Uh, in particular, they face a big physical design problem, and I haven't seen big success stories on this. So our engine, well, I'm glad Zorajit is here. So finally, I found a, a case for our, the risk style engine paradigm that Zorajit and I formulated in a, in a shallow position paper in VLDB 2000. So the risk here really means reduced complexity, so in the sense of the original risk processors. Uh, and the rational is, well, first of all, let's build an RDF engine, and a kernel for RDF and nothing else, not a RDF, XML, OR, GBMS with whatever else. Uh, simplify all operations, be, and the Sparkle language, when you look at its core, it's pretty simple. Reduce implementation choices, so all the joints are pretty much merged joints. Uh, optimize for the simple and frequent case and radically eliminate tuning knobs. So we don't have any physical design here at all, right? Because it's the same for all possible data. And this is essentially, uh, from a bird eye's view, the solution. So first is a standard engineering trick. Don't bother with these long literals, URLs, and strings. Encode everything into integer IDs. And then you're dealing with fixed length ID triples all the time. And then actually this giant triples table approach is not so stupid. And you can afford actually to exhaustively index it. So overall, we built 17 indexes. And that's good for every possible RDF database. Uh, because we're dealing with these triples and fixed lengths, compression kicks in crate. So it's wonderful. The query processing can work almost only with merge joints. We have hash joints also in the repertoire, but we, they, they're hardly ever needed. 
And because of this big simplification, the query optimizer also has a, has a lighter task. So we can afford exact dynamic programming based search of the, uh, or to reversal of the, of the search space of, of execution plans. And this goes up to 20 to 30 joints. So we always find the, uh, within much less than a second, right? Within less than 100 milliseconds. Uh, we also have some, some new techniques, semi new techniques on the statistics uh, for the data. So now on the indexing, so people, the, the literature on RDF is strange. You really see that where these people are coming from. So they are really dreaming of the semantic super strong thing. Uh, but when it comes to systems, they don't, they cannot add one, two, three, right? Uh, so you have these triples, subject, predicate, uh, object, or property object. And, and there are six permutations of them. So you can have six indexes that make sense. Um, and, the, and the literature has proposals like we should have SPO index plus OSP plus PSO. And then they stop, right? So why only have these three and not all six, right? So we actually build all six uh, exhaustively. They, they are all uh, directly in the leaves of, a, of the cluster B plus tree. The data could actually be thrown away. Everything is in the indexes. And the compression is so good that the total size of the indexes is less than the original data. Um, now, the beauty here is that this means for whatever scan or join we encounter, we always have the right ordering of the three components. So we do even more. So these are the first six indexes. Now, the sec next six ones are these. So we also index all binary projections of these triples in all six possible permutations. And the last, the missing component, is replaced by a count aggregate. And this comes very handy when you have to deal with duplicates. So sometimes the sparkle semantics forces you to actually produce a big bag result with duplicates. And we never need to carry these around. So we only work with these indexes and, and then have the counter available. And as we join, we can actually uh, multiply the counters and always only carry it around the cardinality of the result back as opposed to, to, the, to, to this duplication. Uh, and we also do these for, for unary projection. So this is 6 plus 6 plus 3, uh, 15 indexes, and then we have mappings between the literals and the IDs. So this, these are the 17 indexes, and you never ever need anything more, right? So there's no materialized path uh, or view indexing, etc. Um, now on query optimization, as I said, because of this simplicity, we can afford uh, essentially exhaustive plan enumeration in dynamic programming order. So my co-author, Thomas Neumann, has done a, done a lot of work uh, along these lines and knows how to do these things right. So for, we measure this for more than 20 joints, and we're always within 100 milliseconds of finding the, the cost optimal plan. Of course, it's optimal relative to the cost model. If the cost model is wrong, uh, you don't, may not have a good plan. Uh, in, for, on that latter aspect, we build just like standard histograms. Turns out we can quickly uh, compute them from these uh, count aggregated indexes. What we do is we successively merge uh, neighboring um, entries in the, in the, in the indexes um, in greedy order and then kind of approximate an equidepth histogram. We do so until we, the, the structure is small enough to be called a histogram <laughs> so that we can keep it in whatever size limit we give it. This is done also for all six orderings. Um, and in addition, now in, in Sparkle, we, we thought a bit where's the biggest error in the, in the uh, cardinality estimation. And it seems that this is in these lo long join paths. So you, you, you essentially start with one entity and you want to connect it to some other entity over five relations or properties. So, uh, but we, we make a big error here only if we actually have lots of results for this. So that would mean that these paths here, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, these label sequences must be frequent. If they're infrequent, making an independence assumption doesn't hurt you much, right? Because you, you underestimate anyway. Jonathan? There is such a thing, a typical query, you know, how, how long these join paths are. No, no, no. I will, you will see our benchmark in a minute, right? Um, other questions? Yeah. So um, if you have a set of facts, this would work, I think. Yeah. Now, if you throw in the schemas as well, then it turns out that everything is connected because everything ultimately is 
you know, it's an instance of something, and this is a class, so everything is connected to each other. So every of these queries is going to be a self-join on, you know, whatever, how many million tables you have, roughly. Maybe two of these hops, they, they will be self-joins of all these million tables. So I'm wondering how that we would not store it as a million tables. We, we keep our, we're pretty convinced about our storage and indexing scheme. So if you impose a, a schema, it's no, a conceptual it's thing. This particular <laughs> technique here, at some point, it might be, become useless. But it's not expensive. So un, unless, a, like, turn, I mean, you could also materialize these paths, right? which is what uh, the, the uh, body paper uses some techniques along these lines too. But that means you get into physical design. So then actually building the materialized view, maintaining it as you get updates and so on, there's a cost. Here there's hardly any cost at all in building these synopses. And the worst that can happen is that they don't help a lot. So in our, but they would be accurate. I mean, if you have like super frequent path, in fact, in, in the original, in the benchmarking data that our body used, which we also used, uh, you have this situation. So uh, then they just tell you the truth. Yeah? I mean, certain queries do become more expensive, but uh, we, we still in the queries that we are looking at, I don't, I don't, I don't we're, we're doing fine. I don't see the explosion, even if you have a million tables, you would not have joints over a million between a million tables, right? So, so the joint path would be some bounded lengths, right? Right. The, the synopsis may be useless at some point, but it doesn't hurt, right? In fact, we have to have a fallback. I mean, these are pre-computed; they would be exact if you didn't have any selections in addition to the joints. But of course, you have these. Now you cannot pre-compute each and everything. So what we do then, if there are additional selections, and they are the typical with uh, along joints uh, with properties that ha play the role of an attribute. This is why I named them A. Um, they're also only properties, and there would be a constant here. But now what we do is actually we chop up this into the pieces, the largest possible pieces, so that for every piece we have a selectivity estimator in our repertoire, and then we postulate independence and do the usual arithmetics. This goes a long way. So benchmarking, um, as you know, there are lice, damn lice, and benchmark assumptions. Uh, but we went broader than, uh, than the Abadi paper. So this is just a setup. We had two opponents essentially re-implementing the Abadi approach, but not using CStore, but MonetDB, which Abadi himself recommended, uh, because CStore is no longer maintained as open source. And on, on this machine, we got MonetDB to run easily, and CStore would have been a pain. Uh, and we emulated one of the more traditional uh, uh, approaches of dealing with uh, triples uh, uh, stores for RDF, uh, but layering it on Postgres, right? So we're following a bit what our body did. Uh, we had three data sets. So this Barton library catalog is what our body used. Then we applied it to our own knowledge base. This is why this whole work fits into this, uh, the theme of the talk. And we experimented just for the fun of it with uh, an excerpt from a social tagging platform and actually made the tags property names which is maybe odd and, 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 and maybe is not a smart way of doing it this way, but it gave us a data set with very different characteristics because this had like more than 100,000 different uh, property names as opposed to these have like hundreds, right? So we wanted something else. And then you see some of the queries. So this is from our body's uh, benchmark who uses, he actually cheated a bit, he phrased the queries in SQL, and then Sparkle doesn't have the kind of aggregation operators that he actually used. So what we, we implemented this too and, 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 and followed really his rules. Uh, then on Yago, we used the queries of the kind that you've seen before. On the social tagging uh, data, we use things like this. So we played a lot just with the tags. And we had like a set of, we asked people in the group, obviously. I mean, this is a ad hoc benchmark. But still, by the practice of things, we, we uh, think we get some insights. And this, and this could easily entail 20 joints, right? And here are some of the results. In terms of load times and database sizes, uh, the systems were roughly comparable. So MoneyDB seems to create indexes on the fly. So after load time, it looks a lot smaller. Once you run the benchmark, it's a lot bigger than, than our data. Um, this is uh, for the three 
data sets. Each of them came with like a dozen queries or so. And uh, this shows you the geometric means in run times on, for both warm and cold caches. And you see that we are like almost always an order of one, between one and two orders of magnitude faster than the competitors. And interestingly, the two competitors, there's no, none dominates the other. So you also see this Barton experiment that Abadi did is, a, is some specific setting, right? So it does not easily generalize to lots of other things. So here the order is just reversed, right? And, and the, the social tagging data yet exposed yet other characteristics. So in conclusion, I told you about this big vision and mission that we're pursuing in my group. So lift the most valuable raw assets uh, about information, lift them to a level of explicit knowledge in terms of entities and relations between entities. Uh, we're pursuing this knowledge harvesting theme. I talked mostly about this uh, semantic uh, approach. Uh, going after uh, encyclopedic and ontological sources. Uh, we do pursue text mining as well and uh, also a bit uh, of mining social tagging information because this is en vogue and, and also interesting. I see big uh, uh, potential synergies in combining these approaches but I also see big problems. So how do you deal with consistency when you use like a hybrid machinery uh, in general, there are trade-offs between consistency and uncertainty. Uh, uh, I mean, you might go for, for consistency, but then you throw away too many uncertain facts and you, you suffer in coverage. And, and uh, an, an important issue is a long-term evolution. So today's knowledge is out of date tomorrow. So uh, people correct wrong facts in the knowledge base, knowledge changes, how do you tell which of the situations apply? So if you wanted to maintain a knowledge base with time annotations over a long time and to a time horizon, you run into lots of additional problems that we haven't even understood yet. Uh, in terms of ranking, I think we did something interesting. We're in the process of expanding this and generalizing this and, and especially making it uh, a personalized ranking approach. And uh, likewise, on the efficiency and scalability issues, I think we did some interesting piece of work, but there's a lot more to do. Thank you. More questions? <laughs> uh, I have other questions for Gerhard to chat. <laughs> okay, okay, let's take them offline. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Gerhard. Yeah.